Well, good evening. I feel it, you guys. A week from now is going to be Christmas Eve. I'm feeling the crunch. Hopefully you are too. Uh, the week from now will be in our last service at this point. So looking forward to that. It's hard to believe it's already here, but thanks be to God uh, for all that he is doing in our midst this year. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin this night. Uh, in the new year, we'll be doing a new Bible class. Uh, it'll be Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, he was a German pastor during World War II. He was actually killed in the Holocaust. And he writes a fantastic book about life together, community in the Christian church. As we kind of start thinking about the future, this upcoming year, uh, this is a great uh, a conversation starter for many of the options that we're looking at as our congregation moves forward. Uh, with everything that's happened this year, it's going to be a great resource for that. So if you're interested, that'll be in a new year, the first Sunday, whether I think it's January 3rd. Um, I, I'm not even there yet. Uh, but we'll have that resource available. If you want to copy of the book, let us know. Uh, we'll get that to you. If it costs like $10, uh, if you struggle with the cost, let us know. We can find a way to cover that. Uh, and you can join us Sunday after service, and we'll go through that. Also, with Christmas coming up, if you have not yet scheduled coming to Christmas, please do so. The 3.30 and the 6 o'clock are full. Um, so we'll have the Wednesday evening at 6.30, and then we'll have Christmas Eve morning at 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. are still open. Uh, so if you have not yet signed up for time, please do so. Looking forward to that and everything that will be going on as we celebrate the word that has been made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, um, uh, we'll be looking at the next congregational meeting. Uh, it'll be January 17th, Sunday, January 17th, following service. Once the new year comes around, we'll have the budget out for everyone to look at and see. Um, and that, if you want something on the agenda for us to talk about, please let us know by January 3rd so it can be put on the agenda two weeks before uh, that meeting. So that'll be that Sunday, January 17th. Also, the week after Christmas, um, will be the office will be closed for us to recover. I'm going to be in a preaching coma uh, that week. Uh, so I'll have this a little bit more downtime. If you still need something, please give us a call. We just won't be in the office that week. Um, but we'll still be working and do, doing various things uh, just to take a little bit of mind relax there. Also, if you're looking closely in the pews, the puppets are all dressed and ready for Christmas. Uh, they surprised us this past week. As you can see, a couple of halos there. There's the wise men in the very back. Uh, there's some quiet ones dressed in choir robes here in front of me. Uh, so thank you to our puppets who kind of gathered this earlier this week and changed up the outfits as they got ready for Christmas. Uh, so excited about that. Also, finally, our children's Christmas program will air this weekend. Uh, if you want to come after service on Sunday, we'll put it up on the projector here that you can watch. It will also be put up on Facebook and YouTube as well, uh, that day as well. So I think that's all I have. If you have any questions or comments, please give us a call in the office. Um, thanks be to God for all that he has saw, seen us through this year and all that he will continue to do through his son. So let us now continue by the lighting of the Advent candles, the final seventh week of Advent. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Let your light scatter the darkness. And illumine the church. Let's sing our opening hymn, hymn 357, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight, um, in the ancient church, they would say the great O antiphons the week before Christmas, beginning on December 17th, uh, they'd say one each day. These O antiphons come from about the five six hundreds A.D., so they're about 1,500 years old, and they are also the inspiration for the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which we just sang. So tonight we'll say all of them for the intro it, uh, and we'll begin, each of them is a title for the name of Christ. So we have O Wisdom, O Adonai, O Root of Jesse, O Key of David, O Dayspring, O King, and O Emmanuel. So we will say each of those now. December 17th, O Wisdom. O Wisdom proceeding from the mouth of the Most High, pervading and permeating all creation, mightily ordering all things. Amen, teach us the way of peace. December 18th, O Adonai. O Adonai, and ruler over the house of Israel, who appeared to Moses in the burning bush and gave him the law on Sinai. Amen. December 19th, O Root of Jesse. O Root of Jesse, standing as an ensign before the peoples, before whom all kings are mute, to whom the nations will do homage. Come quickly to the widows. December 20th, O Key of David. O Key of David and scepter of the house of Israel, you open and no one can close. You close and no one can open. Come and rescue the prisoners. December 21st, O Dayspring. O Dayspring, splendor of light everlasting. How can light those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death? December 22nd, O King. O King of the nations, the ruler they long for, the cornerstone uniting all people. Come and save us all. December 23rd, O Emmanuel. O Emmanuel, our King and our Lord, the anointed for the nations and their Savior. Come and save us, O Lord our God. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy, 
For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we continue now with our scripture lessons this night. Our Old Testament lesson for this seventh weekend of Advent comes from the uh, pro- from book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, also our sermon text for this evening. Now, when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go, and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We repeat the psalm back to, towards one another, saying, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I will establish your offspring forever. And build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 16th chapter. Now, to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Alleluia and the, the story and life of our Lord Jesus Christ. We say together, Alleluia, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated as we sing the hymn of the day in honor of Mary's confession for all the faithful women. Dear friends in Christ, please be seated. You dwell in the house that the Lord has established forever. Amen. More than once, we have had postal service carriers stop by and question our address here at Christ Lutheran. They tell us that they're looking for 1208 West 14th Street, but when they pull up out front, they happen to see a stone engraved in front of the office entrance that has the numbers 1969 engraved on it. When I hear this, I always give a good laugh, 
And then I tell them that 1969 is the year that this building's cornerstone was laid. In fact, the stone that was laid during the uh, cornerstone lane service was on August 3rd, 1969. Perhaps there's a couple of you out there who remember that day. It was later, on October 19th, 1969, that the first service ever was held in here. Let's see, it's not moving for me. Push the next button. There we go. First service was held in here. And finally, on November 2nd, 1969, was the date that we dedicated this building. You know what that means, right? For those of you who are coming this year, our building is 51 years old. Go ahead and hit the next slide there. Look at that. There she was. Young, looking good. But now she's 51 years old, and you know what that means, right? This building is old enough to get a colonoscopy done. And get one we did. Last month, we had a structural engineer come in here and did some checks and tests on the building, and thanks be to God, when we got the results of the test back, we discovered that this house has no major structural issues. Whew. She's half a century year old, and she's still kicking. Now, of course, they had plenty of routine and necessary maintenance issues that we have to dig through. After all, this old gal is 50 years old, and the wear and tear starts to show. But of course, this is nothing new. I'm told that 50 years ago, when we dedicated this building, that shortly after the opening service, a strong wind blew across and tore several shingles off the roof. Brand new and already in need of a repair. Nothing lasts forever, except the house that God wishes to build. In 2 Samuel 7, we read this. God tells David, Moreover, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is perhaps one of the greatest prophecies concerning Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 7 is one of those texts that you just got to know if you want to know anything about Jesus Christ and about your salvation. If you want to know why Jesus is born of the house of David, you must know 2 Samuel 7. If you want to know the big deal of why angels are telling Mary and shepherds that Jesus is being born to the house of David, you need to know 2 Samuel 7. If you want to know why so many of the crippled people, those who are lame and diseased, cry after Jesus and say, Son of David, have mercy on me, you have to know 2 Samuel 7. This is just the perfect text to have just before Christmas. To be prepared for Christmas, you must know 2 Samuel 7. So, and I know this rubs against the grain for us as Lutherans, But tonight, I need your vocal participation right now. I want to make sure that you're tracking with me. This text is so important to know. So here's the question I need to answer. Ready? What is the text that you need to know for today? Amen. Here's the story. King David, he has been struggling against enemies for his entire life. He's been at war for many years. But in 2 Samuel 7, King David finds himself in a weird place. He has no enemies to fight. There's no wars to wage. There's no armies to lead into battle. It's a time of peace. And this respite has been granted to him by God. God has saved David from the hand of all of his enemies. And during this time, his allies have been motivated to give him resources so that he's able to build his own house, his own palace to live in. But one day, King David is troubled. He lives in a very beautiful house. God has given him so many blessings. God has saved David from the hand of all who hate him. But that's what troubles David. He sits on a glorious throne, gazing out of the palace windows at all of his kingdom. But as he looks outside of his mansion, he can't help but notice that God doesn't have his own house. There's no temple for God to dwell in. In fact, God's house is this little tent that's been pitched outside. The tabernacle, if you remember, that's what it's called. It's the same tent that Moses had constructed 
almost 400 years earlier. Talk about a need for a colonoscopy. David, therefore, wants to do something for God. David wants to build God a house. So he calls in Nathan the prophet. Now, prophets, these are the kind of people who speak on God's behalf. So it's important for David that he gets Nathan's input and his blessing. So Nathan shows up, and David asks Nathan this, Can you believe this? I live in this beautiful house. It's built with the best of cedars that we can find. But yet, I can't help but notice that my house looks better than God's. I am in a great house, and God's just hanging out in a tent. This bothers me, so I'm going to do something about it. What do you think? Well, this sounds pretty good to Nathan, and we can obviously benefit in this as well. Finally, someone who wants to serve God and do things for him. All right, go David. And that's what Nathan tells him. Sounds good to me. Follow your passions, because God is with you. That's what we normally say to people today, right? Follow your heart. That must be, mean that God is with you. Except, when you continue reading through the text, we learn that God is certainly not with David in his passions to build God a house. And Nathan spoke out of turn. Always be careful in following your heart. It doesn't mean that God approves, even if the plan is noble. We read here that in the middle of the night, the word of the Lord, curious phrase, the word of the Lord comes to Nathan, which is the same word of the Lord that has now become flesh in Jesus Christ. So, really, we would be right in saying that in the middle of the night, Jesus comes to Nathan and says, um, yeah, hey, I want you to go back and tell my servant David this. Who are you to build me a house? You know, ever since I brought the people of Israel out from Egypt, I've been camping out in this tent out here. I rather like camping. I've been going to and fro among my people and have been quite fine in this setting. As long as my people have been wandering, so have I. In fact, David, for the last 40, in the 40 years in the wilderness, throughout the conquest of the promised land, throughout the time of the judges of Israel, in the midst of all of these people and through all of these generations, not once have I said, why hasn't anyone built me a house of cedar? No, I have not asked that. I have never questioned anyone wondering why no one has built me a house like you have, David. David, your thoughts are not my thoughts. My ways are not your ways. That's what God is getting at here. And then comes the shock, the big reveal. God then tells Nathan to say this to David. David, I took you from the pasture. You once followed sheep around all day. But instead, I took you and made my people follow you around all day. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have destroyed all of your enemies, and I plan on giving you a great name so that my people can finally be at rest and in peace. So, David, you think you're going to build me a house? No, you're not going to build me a house. Rather, I, the Lord your God, am going to build you a house. It's a play on words. God is not going to build David another house, a palace to live in. God is going to build a lineage for David. God makes a promise to build the house of David, a dynasty of kings. If you kept on reading this chapter, God tells David that he will never lack a son who will sit on the throne. His house, his kingdom will have no end. And if you continued reading, you'll discover that David praises God for this. He says this, Who am I that you have made such a promise to me? This chapter becomes the bedrock for the promise that God will establish David's throne, his house, his kingdom forever. But if you know your Old Testament story, you know that this promise will fall on hard times. After King David comes his son Solomon, who falls away from God at the end of his life. 
But God says, despite this, that he made a promise to David and he intends to keep it so he will not destroy David's house. But after Solomon comes one bad king after another in the house of David. So for the next 400 years, there are only two bright spots in the sons of David, Hezekiah and Josiah. As for the rest of them, for the rest of the sons of David, go read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, to find out more of what happens to them. But finally, after so many bad kings, there comes a day when God takes David's sons into exile. Both the house of God and the physical palace of David are destroyed. And it looks like it's all just come to an end. Gone are the promises of God. Gone are the places where he's been. It looks like even the God's house that he promises will live forever has come crashing down to the ground. And it certainly is a cause of concern for the people of Israel who took it for granted. But after the appointed 70 years of exile, God brings his people home. And one of the people that we read who returns is named Zerubbabel, who is a son of David. But even then, at the end of the Old Testament, there's no longer a son of David sitting on the throne. Persia rules. And then the Greeks come to power. Finally, the Romans. The hope, as the pages of the Old Testament ends, is that God will reestablish David's throne and his kingdom, and that his son, the son of David, will return and will fulfill God's promise to rule forever. And this brings us to our gospel text. The angel Gabriel tells Mary in words that echo 2 Samuel 7, Behold, you will have a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God, he's going to give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The shepherds out in the fields who hear the angelic announcement are told that in the city of David there is one who has been bo born who is Christ and Lord. To the shepherds, this rings in their ears, 2 Samuel 7. The wise men who are told by Herod's scribes that the prophet Micah told in chapter 5 that the Messiah would be born of the house of David in David's line in Bethlehem. Micah is just reiterating the hope that God spoke to David in 2 Samuel 7. The Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. The blind men on the road to Jericho in Matthew 20. All look at Jesus and cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And when they call Jesus that, they're indicating that Jesus is of royal birth. They are calling Jesus this because they know the promise that God would establish one of David's son on the throne forever and that they're hoping that this is Jesus and from him they will receive mercy. And they do. But you know how the story goes after this. They try and tear down David's house one more time. They try to arrest the son of David. They throw a crown of thorns over his head. Soldiers throw a purple robe on him and mock him and call him, ha, the king of the Jews. The sign above his head on the cross reads, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And if you claim to be a king over Israel, this is what's going to happen to you. And then this Jesus, the son of David, dies. It looks like it's all over again. Gone are God's promise. Gone is God's house. The son of David is over. But God made a promise to David that his son shall sit on the throne forever. And the angel Mary told her that God would give Jesus the throne of his father David and that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. So the father raised his son from the dead. Christ has dominion over death itself. God has given to his son, the son of David, Jesus, the authority of heaven and earth. He has exalted Jesus to the throne on his right hand. Psalm 2 tells us that God's answer to the problems out in the world is the exaltation of David's son. David says in Psalm 110 that the Lord God says to David's Lord to sit at God's right hand until all his enemies have become his footstool. 
Jesus Christ fulfills God's promise to David. Jesus Christ reigns as the son of David whose kingdom will have no end. 2 Samuel 7 leads us into all of this. So, where do you fit in with all of this? It's a silly question to ask, of course. Why do we have to fit in somewhere? After all, this story is about Jesus, not us. But there is some merit to this, so I'll fill you in. This is where you fit. The kingdom of God that God has given to Jesus is the kingdom that you now belong to. This is the kingdom that you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God's promise that Christ's reign will never end has now come to you. You are a citizen of an everlasting kingdom that will never fall apart and will never end. Your king is the son of David. You are members of his royal house. You are his people, Israel. Everything, everything hinges on 2 Samuel 7, even your salvation. This is the promise that God has made, and God kept it. And now you have been brought into this kingdom. You are being fed with this son of David yourself. So when you come next week, and you come to celebrate Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, you come to celebrate the fact that God has come through on his promises in Christ for you. And he will come through on his promise that he has made to you, that his kingdom and this king has no end. And thanks be to God that the house that he builds, his bride, the church, will never be destroyed. But that is a different story to tell on a different day. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Let us now turn and stand, and let us confess to our God and to one another our faith that we have in our God by speaking the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, I urge you to lift up your hearts with mine as we join in the prayer of the church, as we go before our God to beseech him on behalf of our needs and the needs of this world. Please join with me in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your children here on earth, and grant us grace so that your holy name would be hallowed by us and all the world through what we say and what we do. Graciously turn from us all that is false and evil, whereby your name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of David, so that by faith the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit according to your will, and both in life and in death, in the midst of good and evil things, 
so that our wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray this night. Especially Lord, we lift them up before you, knowing that the needs that they have, that you can grant to them. And we ask for your mercy and grace to be shown. Lord, in your mercy, give us this day our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all of our needs. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and we rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, we lift up to you all those who serve in our government, all elected officials in federal, state, and local government, that you be with those who serve in our behalf, especially police officers, EMS, doctors, and nurses, and firefighters, those who are in our armed forces, who are here in a way, that they may be brought safely back with their families. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. Lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us of all evil, both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust in you, O Lord, because of your great mercy to hear and answer us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his name we pray. Amen. We now sing the offertory. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing now our closing hymn, the last three verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Amen.